in my school we have never heard national anthem people used to be scared of even having a tricolor in their homes i remember in my village the tricolor on 15th august would be hoisted only maybe in the army camp in rest of the places there used to be pakistani flags i have myself seen pakistani flags mm. being hoisted by terrorists a lot of things have changed in kashmir two days ago on 15th august thousands of kashmiri youngsters kashmiri children teachers men old young lifting tricolor with pride marching in huge processions celebrating uh. the idea of indianness it was not there when i was in a school the ideas of separatism the ideas of extremism they initially come from the elite uh, interpretations it is their interest to manipulate and to i mean to first gather to first get power and then to continue and, and maintain it right the political islam is not the essence of islam it is just an interpretation few years ago mm. you would hear about read about kashmiri youth getting killed kashmiri youth pelt guns kashmiri youth this kashmiri youth that kashmir today mm. kashmir is actually happy because kashmir number 1 has a very stable law and order situation now you are not witnessing encounters anymore there is no stone pelting nobody is being detained youngsters are not missing their classes right terrorists have gone no families now have to mourn the loss of their young kids mm-hmm. kashmiri youth are today aspiring for new jobs some are creating content on social media and making money out of it some are now into tourism some have started their own ventures a lot of startups are coming so many cafeterias have opened in kashmir new cinema has opened up yes. it's a phenomenal new change it's been going houseful yeah, <laughs> the lal chowk has completely changed the smart city project which happened there it has totally transformed that place and youth are now coming out and joining universities in the country. country going and getting jobs there the kind of negativity that was being reported all the time from kashmir mm. that's not there anymore right. kashmir is today kashmir today is a positive happy aspirational developing progressive place mm. which is welcoming people from across the world Welcome to NIJ podcast with Ananya for episode 8. We decided to dive into the life of Shah Faisal, an IAS officer hailing from Kashmir whose remarkable journey through identity, culture, politics and spirituality unfolds. From childhood perceptions to post 370 shifts, join us for an enlightening exploration. Stay tuned for an inspiring episode weaving together identity, culture, politics and unity. Welcome to NIJ podcast with Ananya episode 8. Thank you Mr. Shah Faisal for joining us today. Thank you so much. Let me start before we start with the questions to give an introduction to the audiences why this is really a fan moment for me. <laughs> Because in my uh, dental school in my final year the first time I heard your name was jab family group par aaya mummy ne kaha ki bahut badi achhi khabar deni hai and it is such an inspiring news for you guys. Bachche hame call karo. Aur hum log ne call kiya. and mummy was like tumhe pata hai ki kashmir ka ek ladka hai who stopped the civil services and i was like wow and who is this guy and then we knew who shah faisal was and of course you have so many laurels uh down the road but um, i should admit that this is a big big fan moment thank you me. so much i mean like i also when i speak like to people like this and a lot of people tell me a lot of students tell me that we were in school somebody was in college that time so it has definitely like the way it impacted my life that that moment you know getting into civil services and coming from such a difficult area or having a certain background to the story mm. it always like it still at times gives me goosebumps it does yes must have been a very important thing for me as well the entire nation for many other yes, people as well yes absolutely so बचपन से शुरू करते हैं यू ग्रो अप इन कुपवारा डिस्ट्रिक्ट वॉट वॉज चाइल्ड हुड लाइक एंड वॉट डिड यू थिंक ऑफ बींग कश्मीरी एट दैट पॉइंट एंड वॉट डिड इंडिया मीन टू यू आई थिंक फॉर मी और मे बी पीपल फ्रॉम माई जनरेशन आई थिंक इट वॉज अ वेरी डिफिकल्ट टाइम फॉर अस यू आस्ट अबाउट आइडेंटिटी अबाउट वट वट डज इट मीन टू बी अ कश्मीरी क्या होता है सो आई थिंक you know the time when i started uh, understanding who i am uh, 
I am born in 1983, so by the time 1989, the militancy and other things st- started in Kashmir. I must have just about to, I was about to join school. Right. So I think that was a time of intense identity crisis for Kashmir. Kashmiris were totally in turmoil. Nobody knew what was happening around. I remember my father used to be used to be a fan of Voice of America. We had this radio, uh, morning radio news coming up, and everybody used to be glued to the radio that okay, something is happening across the world. And I, I faintly remember that those were the times when, you know, Russian disintegration was happening that time. The USSR was breaking into things, and also uh, new militancy had started in Kashmir. We were living in a very far away place of Kashmir called Lolab, mm. and in that area, we were suddenly seeing some changes, like people from you know foreign terrorists coming in, mm. people coming from Afghanistan, people tall men like six feet men with long machine guns appearing suddenly in our villages, speaking alien languages you wouldn't not even understand those languages. And at the same time, we had this uh, these militancy related incidents now had started to happen. Um, I faintly remember. I mean, there was this huge uh, Kashmiri Pandit habitation, which was just very close to the Muslim habitation, and there was a lot of interface. My father was a teacher mm. in a school, teacher in a school, so he used to teach uh, many Kashmiri Pandit students as well. And I'm sure the time when I was also like a nursery kid, following him to the school. Uh, I faintly remember there were some Kashmiri pundit teachers as well, and so I had this kind of an inter- interaction with them. And then uh, suddenly, I mean, the, there are these these two very painful images in my mind, which I very infrequently talk about. In fact, maybe I've not spoken about much. I've written about it once. One is the image of a uh, Kashmiri pundit photographer. Uh, yeah, his name was Gash Bhatta. I do not forget his name. So one day we were told that um, he was suddenly shot dead in the village. I had no idea why it was happening that time. And then I remember one more image of an old man um, with a grey beard. Must not have been very tall, around five feet or something. And I remember like a lot of us kids going to the marketplace in the village and then Uh, people telling us, you know, there is something unusual today outside. So it was very early in the morning, and we go there, and we see this um, old man hanging by a tree. Okay, in front of photo night. Yeah, and uh, later on, I came to know that this person was killed by terrorists because, you know, there had been this um, one we used to call this hideout, yeah. where the militants used to hide. So one of the very high tech. Hideouts had been unearthed by the security forces that time in the forests nearby, and uh, this ma- man must have been a shepherd. And the militants thought that okay, he was the informer, and he had been killed. So this was the kind of, uh, you know, the, this is the kind of visual imagery of my childhood as I recollect at times that how it used to be. Uh, another image possibly from my childhood is that um, we had this. Uh, Long hartal of around four months. Yeah. I mean, four months non-stop hartal. And so Which year is this? I don't exactly recall now. I mean, must have been early nineties, mm-hmm. uh, and uh, I was taken out from the Sarkari school, and there was this. I was studying in a government school, and for a very short period of time, I was put in a local private school, uh, and the, it was very unusual because the private schools did not have like the hartal holidays those days. Okay. Yeah, which was very unusual, and uh, that break, like, also is one of the missing periods in my life. Uh, that was the negative part of it, but besides that, it was also a lot of uh, positive memories of that time. I mean, spending time with my father, who was a very liberated, very educated person, and he teaching me a lot of things about life. He was a, he's a very scholarly person there. And you come from a family of educationists, like beyond your father, like. Were your grandparents also? Yeah, my grandparents were also like they were considered scholars in their own little area, and they used to be more having command on. Uh, you know, there was this culture of teaching classic Persian literature mm. in our part of the world, and it also like inter- intercept intersected with spirituality, a little bit of religion or Islamic studies and uh, Sufi studies and Persian literature. So this was the, so my grandparents were also kind of uh, very famous for teaching that to the local kids there. 
but so the point was that you know the time when people from my generation kashmiris of my generation the kashmir of early 90s that was a very difficult place so when you now go back and look at kashmir and when i now look at now the way children are living there i see a lot of change and and i see so much of hope and positivity today given that the kind of trauma in a way uh, that we have experienced as a generation when you talk of those times because uh, i think anybody who was reading newspapers from other parts of the country stone pelting was something that visually you know uh, came out very clearly in newspapers or otherwise what i want to ask you is was it was that was the situation really that grim or do you think it also has a i mean media also has a role to play in the way they were possibly overplaying or possibly i don't know romanticizing the idea of stone pelting in a way do, do you think media had a role to play in the kind of picture that was paint, being painted for kashmir or things were really that see i think uh, stone pelting became i mean it became mainstream after 2008 Uh, before that also you used to have uh, sporadic incidents of stone pelting but when this uh, thing called amarnath land row happened in mm. kashmir and after that and during that row the stone pelting thing came up in a very big way because stone pelting was a way of mobilizing the masses right up to the school kids and the toddlers level mm. little kids coming out and you know you at the top was the terrorist possibly the man with a gun who was leading this entire thing then you had different levels of people who were favoring these ideas and then at the cutting edge level was this young guy young man this young student who was roughly in his class a uh, four to five even at times at who had absolutely no idea what was happening around who had no political consciousness but was somehow getting fascinated with this idea of subversion mm. Yeah, uh, being part of the larger uh, indiscipline and dis- disturbance. So those days, uh, uh, when I, you know, the good thing has happened in that in the last three four years, I think stone pelting has by and large almost disappeared from Kashmir. But when you think about the last fifteen years, mm-hmm. stone pelting was not an ordinary uh, phenomenon in Kashmir. It was not something that you saw and you will say that no, it was an amplification or maybe an exaggeration of happenings in Kashmir. Stone. Pelting was more of a grassroots disturbance. It was a grassroots malady, and you know what used to happen. Uh, I remember my own. I mean, I myself experienced it. That one day I was going in my official car, and a group of young stone pelters stopped me somewhere. Okay, this is when you become a civil. I was in office at that time. It was around two thousand eleven, yeah. and uh, I remember in one village in South Kashmir, I was there, and uh, these stone pelters. Uh, I mean, came and circled around my car, and I locked it from inside. And they started pelting stones. They had no idea who was inside. Mm. And one of them uh, asked asked for, uh, uh, "Can you get something to burn this car?" And one of them tried to climb up mm. on the top of my car, and it was absolutely no way. How could you have possibly manage this? Because these people were not armed, yeah. but they were very emboldened, and uh, it was very tough to deal with them. And and the things were so bad that time i remember one more incident in which what happened is that in this incident also became very famous in kashmir yeah. so when these young boys would come and pick at and stop uh, put roadblocks to st- start stone pelting and st- uh, disturb the security force and law and order they would not allow the local kashmiris to pass so it had created a situation of indiscipline and disorder in the society can you imagine a 9 year old kid asking for a 65 year old man hey where is your identity card yeah. why are you going out we have put hartal today so we have declared that this is going to be a shut uh, market today how come you come out yeah. and a child telling us and a child telling us yeah. and it was not there was this one incident which really like uh, disturbed a lot of us which was that uh, it is i mean we heard about the, you know there was this um, pregnant lady who was being uh, taken somewhere for a delivery mm. and she was being taken in a private car and these youngsters they had no idea what was happening so they told them hey why have you come out so they said uh, this lady has to go to the hospital and so these uh, two two fools out there and they are coming and telling no we want to check if like you were just pretending is there something i have you kept a cushion out there yeah 
or we are going to like first to verify that only then we'll let you go. Mm, mm. It was that. It was that. And it reminds us of an incident during uh, the era of stone pelting, the era of law and order disturbances. It reminded us of the worst times of disturbance and turmoil in our history. Right. So it was not something of an ordinary thing. It was something which had completely destroyed the society, the institutions, the family in Kashmir. Right, the fabric itself. Uh, talking of history, of course, Article 370 again falls into that category of, uh, you know, issues uh, which everybody wants to talk about and have an opinion about based on, I don't know what they're reading on WhatsApp University or otherwise people don't read books as much or don't read history that deeply and yet form opinions. So, before I talk to you about what you thought of it or or how do you think that sort of say had a mental, created a mental barrier of some sorts or not in your mind when you thought about India and Kashmir, uh, but what is the history behind Article 370? I mean, for those of us who are watching this podcast episode before they form their own, you know, perceptions, opinions, uh, if you can give us a brief synopsis of what is Article 370, when did this come about? Who were the main players? That's a difficult history question. <laughs> I will try. Ah, okay. So I think uh, all of us know that, you know, when 1947, when the, on 15 August to 1947, when India got independence, at uh, that time, two dominions came into being. So there was a dominion of Pakistan and there was a dominion of India. Now, there were, there were two parts of the the India ruled by British. One was the British India, which was actually ruled by British directly. Another was the princely states. So you had these many princely states like Patiala, like Hyderabad, like Junagadh, like uh, Kashmir. So they were ruled by local rulers. So when India Independence Act came into being, so these, these, these small princely states became notionally independent. They became literally sovereign. Right? So you had these two dominions of India and Pakistan and then you had these princely states. Now the princely states were given a choice that you join one of the two. It was also the choice of not that so that you don't have a third option. Hmm. You, cannot, you, you cannot. You cannot. You have to go either here or there. Now most of the states joined India. Some of the states where there was a certain demographic in majority, they joined Pakistan. Hmm. Now there were some states which wanted to hold up. Right? There was suppose Junagadh. There was some there was states in the south where people wanted to they wanted to take some more time. In case of Kashmir also there was a standstill agreement signed. That what we'll do is that okay, the both the dominions will wait and give the Maharaja some time to think about this. Now while the standstill agreement was going on and the British the Dominion of India it waited patiently. You know, the Pakistani Dominion sent raiders in. They were tribal raiders while the standstill agreement was on. So they came in, in droves, started killing people in Baramula, they started burning bridges, they started, you know, fighting, because there was no Indian army that time. There was very little presence of that, and you had mainly the state forces and the local militia who were Kashmiri Muslims. So they came in rampages, and then the Maharaja had no choice but to immediately seek uh, the accession with the Union of India. The accession happened. The Indian forces came in. There was a war happening there. And the, the Jammu and Kashmir became a part of India. Now, to, you know, finalize this arrangement of accession, you said, that, okay, we are now doing the constitution building. You remember that time the constitution was being, because we are, the constitution came in 1949, 26th of November. Now, this period during this time, so Kashmir was still like being integrated into the constitution. So, to facilitate their trans trans transition, mm. this Article 370, initially known as some other article, came into the constitution. So, it was to serve for that? It was to serve. It was a temporary provision that, okay, you people should not feel that we have not taken your consent. Mm. So, there were members of uh, Constitution Assembly of the pa Parliament of India at that time. So, this article came in. It was a temporary provision. It was supposed to, like, okay... To begin with, only defense, external affairs, and communications of this princely state of Jammu and Kashmir will be seen from Delhi. The rest of will give some autonomy to the local ruler. This was kind of an arrangement to facilitate it. But it was never going to be final. 
it was never go never going to be something that this will forever continue it is written explicitly there but what happened over a period of time is that we just forgot about this so for somebody like me as well honestly article 370 became something of a mental barrier as you rightly said because it started to define our identity the original the local identity um, as a kashmiri i have always like believed that i had so many other identities as well i had no objection to being a muslim i was a man i was a, those days a kid right i was somebody who belonged to south asia i also possibly i was a universalist maybe wohali identities also you could reinforce at times but ye jo kashmiri identity and this kashmiri muslim identity uh it became very difficult for the generation of people i mean before and after us who could not somehow adjust this with indian identity i told you there was this identity crisis which was happening to kashmiris during that time the who are we how do you accommodate the larger kashmiri identity within the indian identity mm, right okay so people would start giving examples but in 1947 we were a princely state and we were independent ah uh. i mean 1947 is yesterday is that the way you define your relationship with india or do you go a little bit further a little bit backwards and you look at okay what was there before us how did the princely state come into being mm. how do you look at india from like a nation state angle how do you look at it from a civilizational angle how has kashmir been a part of the indian civilization for last thousands of years how do you negate those conditions and those connections and that time the law of the land was followed accession happened very rightly the article came in i mean how can there be any question now but the question remained because i told you that 370 became something of a permanent thing in our minds right and over the years the politics kept on happening although the parliament kept on extending more laws to jammu and kashmir right over a period of time many amendments kept happening to this but still this larger idea came into being that but we are different people okay we have some special status we are some special people we have some special status and whenever a law used to be passed by the parliament uh, there used to be this line in the law that uh, it does not apply to jammu and kashmir mm -hmm. so then you would at times i mean it is not a fault of kashmiri youngsters to start feeling that the laws which parliament makes do not extend to us right so we are different people yeah so going back to that accession because i was uh, reading up on this in fact i came across i was in fact i think having a conversation with my father in law and you know i was telling him that i'm reading up on kashmir and why did i asked him why did kashmir not integrate with the union of india as did the other princely states including hyderabad and junagadh and he said ki you know maharaja jo the us samay uh he had some reservations and because he took time to accept the the reality you know that is the time when the invaders which you spoke about from pakistan came in and uh, you know there's a problem and then of course they rushed to become a part of the indian union when i was googling this i came across another article by uh mr kiran rijiju which now talks about you know going back into this history it goes back i have read to, that article yes you have and it talks about uh, nehru's own nehru ji's own admissions in uh, in in the assembly in the parliament uh, where it talks about how maharaja did make some maneuvers in terms of you know uh, indicating his willingness to have kashmir join the union of india do you you've read that article what do you think is the historical politics behind what was possibly happening at that time i think it's very difficult to talk about nehru by somebody like me who is not a historian who is not somebody who i mean um is a scholar of the subject but at times yes it i i often wonder like because you know having read nehru and having read discovery of india having read his letters having read his world history like i have been really impressed by the way and really inspired by the kind of things he used to write and come come across as a fiercely liberal person and somebody who really uh, believed in the ideals of um, 
universalist ideals, be believed in the ideal of democracy, secularism, even, no doubt in that. But I think also he possibly could not that time anticipate that what was going to happen. I mean, at times, the greatest of the statesmen, they can also make mistakes. There is no, I mean, gain saying to that. Mm. And I think when it comes to this point about not appreciating that time, that how the situation in South Asia was changing and how Pakistan was like uh, going to take advantage of that position and how important that time was to assuage the Maharaja's interests and to quickly bring him over. And uh, I think there were intelligence leads also that something was going to happen. And you could not have afforded to be, I mean, to be, I won't say less cautious, I'll say to be like uh, relaxed at that time. Okay, let's take some more time about this. I think it was Sadar Patel finally who's... Um, I won't say aggressive approach, but I think whose decisiveness uh, made it sure that the accession happens on time. And honestly speaking, when you today go to Kashmir and you look, I mean, if you look around and you go to certain places like HMT, you go to a place called Gogo Land, which is very close to the airport. Yeah. I mean, the, these tribals, the raiders, uh, the raiders had come as close as the Srinagar airport. It was a matter of few hours. So they completely and this would have been lost. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you we lost a brigade at that time, Brigadier Rajinder Singh. Mm. He became the first major casualty of these raiders because he held out mm. the raiders' invasion on his own before the landing of the Indian army at that time. Okay. Yeah. So, as you talked about blunders, I mean, definitely, I mean, not uh, being fast paced on this that mm. time uh, would have been one thing. I think it would have definitely saved a lot of things to us. Because we already lost a lot of territory by then, Muzaffar Abad was was gone in the first few days of the of the of the tribal raid. Yeah. So and that was that used to be part of Maharaja's uh, territory. Mm. So Maharaja, when and when the situation actually became very desperate for Maharaja, yeah. Then the last, I mean, twenty seventh October, twenty sixth, twenty seventh October night, this thing happens finally. But I mean, you two to three days before that, the situation was such that Maharaja also felt that possibly he will lose his own life. Mm, right. He had to literally run away from Kashmir. So we could not, we should not have possibly allowed the situation to deteriorate to that level. And maybe, for, I mean, statesmanship is all about foresight. Yeah. yeah. It's about anticipating the dangers around. I mean, I think somehow that time, those dangers could not be anticipated. Uh, maybe our leadership was much more trusting of the people. We thought, oh, these are good people around. Yeah. So there is this virtue paradox which happens that hey that there are good people around us. So the way I am nice, people will be nice to us. Mm. But I think one lesson which we have learned in geopolitics and in international relations is that there is no universal morality which guides this. I mean, it's might is right. It was true then. I think it's true now. Do you think, I mean, that for sure is a mistake. I mean, what do you think and feel about, you know, the Kashmir issue being taken to the UN? And, you know, now we know how geopolitics works, right? Uh, wherein you provide, make Pakistan party to an issue as Kashmir. And you've grown up in Kashmir. So what did you think of the UN? Uh, <laughs> I mean, I mean, in the hindsight, it, it at times sounds like plain stupid. Uh, that, I mean, it's also difficult. I mean, we are not living in that historical reality at the moment. Uh, not part of that historical uh, period, okay. yeah. So not really much we under we can much understand it how these decisions happened that time. But honestly, like when you look at what was happening across the world that time, I'm mean, taking it to the to the United Nations definitely to. Uh, I'm sure the sentiment must have been that okay, we need some sort of legitimacy. The the world must put its stamp on this. Let's maybe Nehru was also very confident. That because you had Sheikh Mohammed Abdullah there, so he had a hand, his finger was on the pulse of the people, he had a huge following there. So maybe Sheikh Abdullah was very, uh, like, he must have been like an instrument or maybe a very huge influence for Nehru to, to take this decision because uh, Nehru was very confident that this is going to come back to us. Even if we ask Kashmiri people, we actually get a plebiscite done, nah. it's going to come back to us. But I mean, that apart, I mean, there was no need to do this. It was already with you. Right. So that realism, I think, is something which was missing mm. in his policy that time. Around the same, I mean, 
a few years later on, suppose there was one more thing which happened, which is this Indus Waters Treaty. I mean, it also at times come, comes across as a, as a surprise that you we are we are an upper apparel state. So the three rivers which are going there, they go through our territory. We have full control. Not that we are going to build, do anything to those rivers, but as an upper, upper ripe air, and you have a certain right over this. And then voluntarily you abdic abdicate those rights and you give it to the neighboring country that, okay, you will have exclusive rights to these three rivers. Mm. And in turn, you are expecting that, okay, this country will make peace with us. Or we'll have friendly relationship. We'll have trade. I mean, I don't know. Either the world has changed so much that these ideas of outreach, ideas of engagement with the neighboring nations, they come across now as stupid. Mm. Or maybe he didn't possibly understand that time what kind of neighbors he was uh, surrounded with. I mean, China, he misunderstood. I'm sure he misunderstood Pakistan as well. I think he didn't have an idea what kind of rogues right. uh, India was surrounded with. Right, right. Going back to your childhood, you are an MBBS doctor. And we spoke about Article 370 and regional, sub-regional identities, Indian identity. And then, I mean, you could have written uh, state civil services, Kashmir provincial services. You chose to write union public service commission exams. So you did have some sense or some idea of, you know, being part of the larger Indian union. I mean... What was Who it like? Didn't have? No, that what was, was it like? Yeah, I'll I'll come to that. What was it like for a Kashmiri youth to be applying? I mean, you wouldn't have guessed that you'll top and you'll get a cadre of your choice, right? Uh, no, that was never a question. Honestly, mm. aspirationally, mm. Kashmiris have always been a part of the larger Indian consciousness. Mm. Aspirationally, Kashmiris have always wanted to study in other parts of the country. Mm. They have always wanted to have jobs in other parts of the country, to hold public offices in other parts and the rest of the country. Kashmiris have also held very high public offices in the parliament, in the central government. Okay. Yes. That was never a problem. The problem is only vis-a-vis -vis the identity part. How do you, the sense of self. Okay. Or the sense of us. Who are we? So even when you're posted in Delhi, it used to be like, it's a Kashmiri poster. Ah, yeah. right. When you go to Arunachal Pradesh and work there, it's a Kashmiri poster in Arunachal Pradesh. Right. And, and, us and them, that, that so thing. So this identity of being a Kashmiri, it's such a prominent and such an, I mean, I'll say, it's a very important identity for Kashmiris because, you know, it's also associated with a certain language. It has a certain look associated with this, a certain accent. I told you before also that you come from Lucknow and it's very tough for me to speak in Urdu before you because uh, Kashmiris speak with a very heavy accent when it comes to speaking Urdu. Right. So there are a lot of things which make Firan the, 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 the thing that we dress, we wear, the kind of experiences of, or memories of winters that we have. Hmm. So Kashmir as an imagined community. So Kashmiris, it's very important. It's For Kashmiris, it's something extremely important. Right. You know? Is that what Kashmir is? This is how it used to be. Hmm. This is how it used to be. Is it evolving? Is that definition evolving? What does it I mean, how does it evolve? It evolves with education. It evolves with training. It evolves with exposure. So now when you feel that, no, you are a part of the larger whole, that Kashmir, Jammu and Kashmir, it is just a small, it is just one of the states in the Union of India. Okay, there are so many other states where there are also very special people. Tamils are also very special people. Bengalis are also very special. And very, very diverse. Very diverse. And Northeast has like so many people with such Within unique East, guys, yes. with so many unique cultures. Right. So then you realize that, okay, maybe there is this larger box where you belong. But that happens only when education is being given correctly. In our case, I told you the kind of turmoil that we were going through and the kind of disruptions we had. Disruption was so much that in the last 30 years, Kashmiri schools have been shut for 2,000 days. How much is that? That is roughly around six years. Wow. So my generation of Kashmiris has lost around six years of schooling to Hartals. Hmm. Right. With everything else that's happening outside the schools. Yeah, and, and everything homes. else, the whole, the rest of the world is doing well. Now, when it comes to the school, now what was happening in, inside the school that also needs to be seen? You know, two days ago on 15th August, we saw something unprecedented. 
we saw thousands of Kashmiri youngsters, Kashmiri children, yeah. teachers, men, old, young, you know, lifting tricolor with tri, marching in huge processions. And it was not that much only. I then saw thousands of people posting their DPs on their social media accounts. The selfies. Of with... their own. Mm. Celebrating mm. the idea of Indianness. It was not there when I was in a school. In my school, we have never heard national anthem. People used to be scared of even having a tricolor in their homes. Right. I remember in my village, the tricolor on 15th August would be hoisted only maybe in the army camp or in some school somewhere. In the rest of the places, there used to be Pakistani flags. I have myself seen Pakistani flags being hoisted by terrorists. It's not so much to do with the child, but the kind of environment. So the child is being brought up in, a, in an environment yeah. where he doesn't even know. And he is, this is the identity complex and the identity crisis I was telling about. Right. You had Uzbek militants around us uh -huh. with those large machine guns. I still can, you know, kind of recollect the babble, the sound of that alien language which they used to speak. Mm. Uh, those uh, Afghanis that time, and I, we didn't we didn't understand what are they doing there. Mm. Who were these people? So that change is that like, I think now Kashmiri consciousness is finding itself at peace or uh, kind of merging with the larger... Reconciling, with, yes, the, reconciling yeah. with the larger reality. And the best part is that it is happening voluntarily. Yeah. And 370, when happened, people said, oh God, I was also one of those people who thought that maybe this is the end of the world. Because the way we had thought and believed it, that, okay, you know, this is so important, this identity, this article is so important, that this article goes and there is an attack on your primary identity. Nothing of that sort happened. People realized with time that this was all a facade. This was all a hoax. And today, Kashmiri youngsters, yesterday, if you see last last week, the things which happened there, they're so heartening. Right. right. For me particularly, really, I feel so proud and so happy about this. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you spoke about this. I mean, you have a son, right? Tomorrow, if he asks you, why was Article 370 removed? What would you tell him? I mean, I'm sure he will find his own answers uh, as he grows up. But I think it's not just one article which has been amended. I mean, amendments, hundreds, of, more than 100 amendments have happened to the Constitution by now. And more and more amendments will keep happening. Uh, it's an evolving polity. In an evolving polity, things will keep changing. And then you also understand, I mean, it takes some time for anybody who has been a defender of Article 370 mm. to understand that, okay, I was, you know, in our own innocence, we keep on defending something because we believe it's good. For us, it's like, oh, but I was just defending an article. It was an article of the Constitution. Yeah. And what did this article do? It provided some sort of a middle ground for people who did not believe in the idea of India to at least believe in some parts of the constitution that, okay, there was a way to engage. But can you understand the kind of ambiguity and gray zone which it creates? Right. So when you then look at the look in the hindsight at this thing, then you understand how much clarity it brings in. Yeah. You know, it then creates only two kinds of people. One, people who believe in this or people who don't believe in this. Right. There is no space for partial believers that, okay, I am there, but I am still not there. So I think my generation of kids, somebody like my kid, I think they're very lucky because they will not have to wrestle with these questions tomorrow. The who are we people? My kid is exactly in the same age in which I was when the militancy st started. And today, he has absolutely no, que no, no confusion in his mind. Right, right. My kid goes to the school. He also reads Muslim prayers there. He also reads this uh, Achutam Keshavam. Krishna Damodaram. He also reads prayers from other faiths. He reads interfaith prayers. He also, I mean, very early in his life, he has learned to play Janagana on a, on a piano. Mm -hmm. He is somebody who is picking and lifting tricolor with a pride. He has absolutely no question, confusion, confusion in his mind who is. He doesn't, doesn't know 370. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think that is a great favor done to the new generation of Kashmiris that, okay, whatever has happened in the past, this is the fact. This is the reality. 
and new generations of Kashmiris will not have to experience this at all. Yeah, and and battle with this who fundamental people, idea of identity. Who are we people? Yeah, and the civilization. You know, this important input, I think, which which I often keep on reminding to myself and also to the Kashmiri youngsters is that uh, you have to look at things from a civilizational. Mm-hmm. Kashmir or Kashmiri identity because Kashmir still has a majority population belonging to a certain demographic who where religion is a part of life right religion is a part of that consciousness but should that alienate you from the larger Indian consciousness I don't think so because if you go a little bit backwards you will realize that before our ancestors accepted this Islamic faith they had accepted other faiths as well so there was this continuity Civilizational continuity. continuity, which which kind of connects us to backwards, and that civilizational connectivity continuity was not just something which was in the history books mm. or something which was an event in time. Mm. It is something which is even today present in us. It's in our thought. It's in our way of speaking. It's in our way of thinking. Uh, in our worldview, you know, this Kashmiri mind or something you mentioned just a little while ago about Kashmiriya. So Kashmiri. Going back to this, what is Kashmiriyat? So Kashmiriyat is um, a very unique way of thinking of Kashmiri people. Mm. It's not just about how Kashmiris look or Kashmiri culture or Kashmiri handicrafts. Not just that. Not the visible It is the visible part as well. Okay. But it's also the Kashmiri way of life, which is a very inclusive and a syncretic way of life. If I go back to one positive image from my village, which defines Kashmiriyat, it would be the way Kashmiri Pandits and Muslims both used to go to the local shrine there. The shrine was a Muslim shrine. And we had, you know, the Friday and Saturdays we used to have these get-togethers at their shrine, special prayers at their shrine. Be there a wedding in the Kashmiri Pandit family or in the Hindu or in a Kashmiri Muslim family. The bride had to visit that shrine and people would visit. On Eid, the gifts would be exchanged between the Kashmiri families and the Muslim families. There used to be literally brotherly relations between them. And the festivals would, would be celebrated together. The way Kashmiri Pandits prayed and the way Kashmiri Muslims prayed, they, they prayed in their temples, we prayed in their mosques. Yeah. But there was a certain un, certain similarity to the tones, the spiritual feeling which, which, which it evoked, very much similar, because you came from the same stock. A Kashmiri Muslim would never do anything which could possibly be insulting towards a temple. And Kashmiri Muslims would used to be very careful of places called, you know, the Kashmiri temples are, the, the way we put it in Kashmiri is that it's a very garam place. This, these places came across as something where there was a lot of energy. Energy. We don't want to do anything but the mizi, the beya, the pini, utar se karniya. So people would be very careful while walking from a the religious place of Kashmiri Pandits. Likewise, it may come as a surprise to a lot of people. Mm. In Kashmir, people are extremely respectful towards the cow. Okay. It's a very unique thing. Yeah. In Kashmir, I mean, beef, there is no tradition of beef as such. It's not in the cuisine. It is unbelievable. I, mean, I know so many people if their cow dies by natural causes, there will be grief for four days in their homes. It is still there. Yeah. Because it also tells you about the continuity. Kashmir it is about continuity. It's about the synthesis of Buddhism, of Shivai's, Shivai traditions and Islam, that we will be kind towards all nature. We'll be kind towards all people. Your faith doesn't matter to us. And we will believe in a simple, uh, sustainable living. And the two, I mean, just concluding this, two of the, I think, biggest symbols of Kashmiriyat would be one, the patron saint of Kashmiris called Sheikh Nuruddin Nurani. Mm. Actually, the person who, through his poetry and his teachings, taught his message of Sufism and Islam in Kashmir. And then his spiritual uh, master, a lady called Lalala Dat. Mm. People claim her as a Kashmiri pundit or a Hindu, some claim her as a Muslim. Nobody knows what she was. Mm. But she was the, the fountain from which this spiritual stream uh, came out. 
So that's essentially Kashmirian. And that is something we need to cherish. And that is, the, I think, the biggest image of positivity from Kashmir when you talk about that. that those are the... But that is the I kind of religion. Yep. Yeah. Kashmiris are familiar with. I mean, today you may have a lot of discussions about what religion means. But this is how Kashmiri understand, Kashmiris understood religion at a certain point of time. That is also changing. I'm not saying that things are not changing or things have not changed. But, I mean, Kashmiriyat was effectively a way of um, understanding religion, understanding the world, your way of interaction with the fellow human beings, your way of life your worldview of tolerance, inclusiveness, syncretism, I mean, that's how it was. Right. So I have a question for you, which I was asked uh, of a, I should say, a youngster, right? I mean, I don't put myself in that category, but somebody much younger than me and... Uh, what they, do I like, do if you're not a youngster? <laughs> they were like, Didi, you know why all the problems are happening, all the fights are happening in the world. And you know, one, one thing, which is the root of the problem, I said, what is the root of the problem? And that uh, youngster was like religion. Religion ko nikal dijiye ab dunya se and sari problems solve ho jayegi. And this is really a growing sentiment. It is. Uh, amongst a lot of younger mini millennials and I'm sure. uh, you know folks who are younger than that uh, who feel that is, is so my question to you do you think is religion the root of the problem or what is it? What would you answer? I think yeah, it's also a very complex question and I have also reflected upon it many times in the past. There have been moments when I felt that exactly like the millennials feel that religion is the cause of all the wars and strife that has happened in the past. So much bloodshed. Even today, if we are divided in nations and ethnicities and sects, it's because of religion. But then if you look at why in the first place religion must have come about, mm. I think it came about and it originated as a means of correction. As a means of correction. Correction. So, human beings, when we are born, we are not born with any sort of idea about how to run this world. But because you have to live in a society, so you are expected to behave in a certain way. So, I think the initial societies must have found out that, okay, the best way to deal with the uncertainties of life and to explain why we are here on this planet. And where we have to go, these questions, nothing could have possibly answered these existential questions. Right. So the religion came in. So religion, besides fulfilling your quest of these existential questions and giving you answers about who you are and where you are going, why do you die one day and when you are born, why are you born? I mean, these questions remain unanswered. But somehow religion tells you various answers. In Muslim Islam, it tells you, okay, there is an afterlife. So prepare for that. In Hinduism, it tells you, okay, there is this life only. The karma is here. Prepare for this life. In Buddhism, it tells you, okay, the faith is about dharma. It's about dhamma. It's about, um, you know, achieving enlightenment in this part of the world. In Christianity, then it tells you, okay, your purpose of life is to be good to the man, humankind. Do charity, be nice, and then you will be re reunited with the Holy Spirit. Uh, so, there, I think, Religion was expected to deal with and to resolve the most important existential, existential challenge yeah. and the existential crisis that the human beings had. But unfortunately, with time, it became a source of division. It was supposed to unite. Is it? Then it became a source of division. And we saw wars and we are the kind of strife which we are seeing across the world has been. And not just that, it also became a source of irrationality. I mean, I think one thing why Western civilizations, uh, Western civilization uh, underwent the Renaissance was because it challenged the notions of a clergy that time, the religious clergy that time. Yeah. So I think when it comes to religion, we need to understand and reinterpret and reimagine what faith means to us. Yeah. Today, I think if there's a problem, it is because religion becomes a part of the identity. You've been constantly talking about identity from the yeah. from the moment we started this conversation. So I think keeping religion as a very private affair, mm -hmm. as a personal thing, as something which is for your own spiritual growth, I think that resolves all the questions. Because then it makes you realize that, okay, there is this larger spiritual or continuity of consciousnesses which transcends all faiths, right. isn't it? So then it resolves all questions. It basically brings you together. It tells you in 
in sufi uh, thought it do you know there are these two ways of looking at one is called wahdatul wujud and there's wahdatul shuhud so wahdatul wujud effectively means that you know there is this unity in all of us this light which transcends which crosses every living being uh, you were speaking before this about um, i think you also talked about talked about how spirituality for you is about you know this common spark which is everywhere between us so that brings us to the essential human core mm. core values of compassion humanity tolerance inclusiveness and that is all the questions right i think the problem with us is that we have been confusing religion with identity confusing religion with mobilization which finally leads to power or finally leads to creation of communities i think that is something which is really destroying this world today right and and as we spoke i mean spiritualism i mean vasudev kutumbakam is a very spiritual uh, construct right where where world is indeed you know one family quantum physics is also proof that yeah. that this is all we spoke you about united humanity. yes yeah. maybe that's the answer to vasudev kutumbakam you see the kind of phenomenal idea it is the world is one family now in even in our g20 deliberations we use this one family one future it actually addresses all the issues of today and issues of tomorrow because the way we are now dealing with a technological problem that okay ai is coming in a big way what is it going to do to the society how will the education change how will the human nature change how will the livelihood is change then you have a climate issue coming up then you have pandemics and covid like stuff is happening we don't know how many more uh, such bugs may be coming to us in future that makes us realize that effectively our vulnerabilities are so common yeah we're all in it together we are all in this storm together mm. so the only way possibly to deal with this would be to then get together yes. and overcome all the differences that we have i think the most of them would most of um, important of them would be religion that how do we possibly connect across the faiths mm. isn't it to reach to an understanding where we can more collectively uh, deal with these challenges of future right which all affect us in very very similar ways whether it's as you said ai technology environment i mean there are so many things all when you tend to realize it you realize that all your problems are common i like elon musk i mean there are people like him yeah. who have actually demonstrated what it means to be a human being a human being means somebody who will think about the happiness the welfare the the good of the entire human race mm. irrespective of irrespective of where you are any isn't it so uh, i would say even human being is not something like about human being only but about the entire e- universe right. it's also about the entire ecosystem isn't it uh, about animals uh, we don't have to forget about nature we do at times unconsciously put man at the this this anthropocentric view of the universe that okay man is something around to whom uh, this everything is built around that but i think we are more and more now moving to a consciousness where we see man as just one of the actors but yes man as man not as man as somebody who's an asian or an american or an african yeah. i think we need more people with that kind of thinking isn't it humanist like uh, universalist universalist Humanist. right right so we have had i mean Uh, I was reading a paper a couple of days ago and I somebody shared something very phenomenal with me. It was a paper on Swami Vivekananda. I think it made me realize this paper that he is one of the most misunderstood persons on in our history. I mean after reading him I haven't I cannot think of anybody who was more emancipated who were more internationalist and cosmopolitan and modern in 1893. Can you imagine like 200 years ago like or around 100 100 or 100 i mean 120 years yeah yeah like uh, around about yeah. this man was really an internationalist and a humanist at that time mm. so we don't have to even look to the west i mean we have people like that in our own country yeah. who have actually demonstrated to the world what it means to be a human being right he's spoken about identity religion spiritualism and and I mean spiritualism in practice right not as an abstract concept talking about religion and politics what is political islam what what does it mean what is it in theory what was it intended to be 
and where do you see it fit into the modern constructs of democracies and republics uh, that we have? So I think one of the tragedies of uh, organized religion has been that it often gets misused for political purposes. Uh, knowledge and power, we must have, I mean, Foucault has often been talking about how these two interact and what kind of, uh, you know, how power is actually exercised and how power is manifested. Religion becomes an important tool for power. Uh, and, and religion in Islamic communities, what, what we have seen is that uh, a new interpretation to Islam was given. Although Islam, why did Islam come into the being? It was basically for the character building of the people. I mean, a religion is meant for the character building. It's meant to to ameliorate the beastly or the uncivilized aspects of a human being's personality, isn't it? Right. It is with a with a message that okay, you are in this on this planet and you have a certain mission. That mission is to be nice to everybody. The mission is to live as a disciplined being, and be grateful to the blessings of the God, whosoever has created you. Unfortunately, what happens is that. This interpretation of faith, or Islamic faith, some people took it a little bit too far and they said, no, Islam is not about your personal life, it's not about your character building, it's about having a community, and it is then about having your own sovereignty of, they called it, sovereignty of Allah, that only God has the sovereignty. The territory has to be developed and, and ruled and governed on the principles of Sharia. They said the nation state means nothing. Islam is a transnational or a supranational consciousness yeah. where there is an ummah. That ummah is to be guided or governed on the principles of Sharia. And that Sharia is de determined by a group of ulama who will tell you, okay, what those rules are. Now that creates a problem fundamentally because it excludes a lot of people who don't believe in Sharia. And it also puts a lot of restrictions on the way that society is run because it interprets Islam in a way which is not possibly fit for the challenges of the modern times. Because that interpretation is so regressive, it doesn't allow any space for women. We are seeing that in Afghanistan. It has a certain dress code. It has a certain view on education. It has a certain view on LGBTQE. It has a certain view on anybody who is diverse. It has a certain view on anybody who is not like you. Even Shias do not figure anywhere in this. Even Ahmadis don't figure. Even other sects like Barelvis. So then this idea of takfir starts that, okay, we you do not belong to this community. That is basically where the problem then comes in. That religion then becomes an over-encompassing idea which affects every part of your life the way we are seeing now in Afghanistan. And you will very, very much agree that, I mean, Afghanistan is not a model which anywhere is close to the modernity. So political Islam is not the essence of Islam. It is just an interpretation which was led by people like Hassan Banna, like Sayyid Qutb, like Sayyid Abu Lala Maududi. In, in our part of the world, the most influential thinker who, you know, gave political Islam a huge kind of flip was um, Abu Lala Maududi and his jamaat -e islami and uh, this entire thing in late 1980s when it came to Kashmir also. Then this Kashmiriyat idea, this idea of Sufism, it started to dissipate away. People started feeling, oh, but we have nothing to do with our ancestors. We have nothing to do with our other faiths. Yeah. We do not believe in democracy. We do not believe in secularism. We have to now organize Kashmir, suppose, in the format of nizam -e mustafa Okay, and in that place, Kashmiri Pandits have no place, so they need to be expelled. So there is this new exclusionary and a very violent and aggressive way of uh, worldview which comes in because of this thing. So then there is no place and that ultimately leads to violence and bloodshed the way we saw in Middle East. Yeah. And that destruction, I think that's that example is in front of everybody. So talking of political Islam and and as a modern progressive Muslim, you, you are in the civil services. Do you think the change has to come from within? I think the change, the first responsibility for this change is with the ulama, with the people who understand the subject, who need to understand that, you know, I, I can myself tell you that 20 years before, a lot of people would not click a photograph. 
not click a photo they would not click because a photo it gives an because image. it was an image and it was considered to be un islamic and today almost all the mawlanas you will find them on social media <laughs> So how was this interpretation changed? So there is this concept of ijtihad. Ijtihad means how do you reinterpret? Okay. How do you apply reasoning and then look at the Quran and hadith and the Islamic scriptures in the modern way and way which seems to be more plausible because there has been a lot of interpretational errors. There is this hadith on Ghazwai Hind for example. A lot of people say that there is a hadith where prophet says that it is a duty on Muslims to attack India. So this hadith is completely fabricated hadith. So basically, when the hadith were being collected, they were out. They were lacks of hadith. And then ultimately, when Imam Bukhari found the most authentic ones, he collected them in maybe seven, six thousand, six and seven thousand hadith. Were out of these two lakh hadith. So now you have, if you want to go and quote from those hadith also, then you will have something for everything. But the issues of authenticity come in there. So our Molanas, I think, will have to understand that Quran was revealed in Arabic, right? And Arabs are changing. The Arabs are discovering new interpretations of the scriptures. Arabs are now realizing that this word could possibly be used this way as well. For example, there is the Surah Fatiha. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim Maliki Yawmiddin Iyaka Nabdu Wa Iyaka Nastain Ehdina Sirat Al-Mustaqeen Sirat Al-Azina Anamta Alayhim Ghair Al-Maghzub Alayhim Walazzali Ameen In the last line of the last line O Lord, show us the path of the right people Do not show us the path of the deviant ones It doesn't say anywhere Who are the deviant ones Now what people have done when they interpret it in Hindi or Urdu or English, they put a bracket. Oh Lord, do not show us the path of those who deviated. Bracket, Christians, Hindus, Barelvis. So then you have your own will to put what, whatever you want to put into it. It is the responsibility of the intellectual, the Muslim intelligentsia, to give the right message of Quran and Hadith to the world. I mean, Quran, which has been revealed with the principle, that, O oh Lord, show me the right path. Right. And the principles of justice. Islam means submission. Mm. The word. Submission, simplicity, humility, peace. How could possibly this religion be then promoting violence? It is just because our people did not convey the message of Islam correctly. I think that message of Islam needs to be correctly conveyed. Right. There's a lot of scholarship on how the ideas of separatism, the ideas of extremism, they initially come from the elite uh, interpretations of uh, whatever is happening around us, right? So, because it's the elite uh, groups of people who first want to partake of the power. It is their interest to to manipulate and to, I mean, to first gather, to first get power and then to continue and, and maintain it, Right. But then there are these Pasmanda people who are from like, because what happened, one interesting, which, which was that in Islam, initially there was no caste system. But Islam also kind of uh, adjusted to its local context. So the caste system continued in Islam also. So the Muslims also, you have the Muslims who came from lower castes. They became Pasmanda Muslims and they remain very back. Over the years, I mean, elite Muslims did get a lot of benefit, but these people did not get. And they had to suffer a lot. And these ideologies which came in, they fundamentally impacted the elite mind, I must tell you. Today, in the rural parts of India, the common Muslim, the ordinary Muslim, he is living at peace with the other communities. It's happening everywhere. Because they have not yet even gone to that level where they will understand what does it mean to divide. So these people are actually the core which needs to be reached out to which needs to be included in the in the fruits of the development. And because they are the people basically who are today also upholding the, the ideas of Indian Islam or the ideas of syncretism, which actually Indian Islam stands for. Sounds for. Yeah. Right, right. Taking a question on UPSC, and I'm not going to ask you no, that please for don't. It's okay. UPSC. Like, I'm not doing that. Uh, we've been talking about ideas of 
justice and equal opportunities. Do you see UPSC itself as a sort of a social leveler in a country which is this diverse and, you know, has people from all segments of the society? Do you, do you feel UPSC still exists at, as that institution which a youth can say that there is a fair and practical uh, a fair or objective exam hota hai, which you know have an equal opportunity to write and then probably hold the highest power of uh, the seat of power or governance I think that's a very lovely way of I mean putting it out there that what it does to us what kind of opportunity it does give to us it's not just about uh, getting a job it's basically about getting a share in the power and I think it's about the power to rule there's one way of looking at it. The power to change is another way of doing it. Mm. So the power to change your own society, your own nation, the power to move communities towards progress. I think that share, the share in that power, the, sh the you know, the stakeholders, the ownership, the, ownership the, the stakeholding in that power is very important. And I think for people like me, I mean, who have absolutely no other way, we don't have money, we don't come from political families. We don't have that kind of clout. I mean, I think UPC is the only way where you can come into the decision-making level and be a stakeholder to how this country is to be run right. and be a crucial stakeholder and actually make decisions and change lives and in a short period of time. It takes you four to five years in most of the states to become a district collector. Four to five years. So from being an ordinary student who cannot even take a decision of like, uh, should I go for a movie or not? Yeah. Suddenly you're taking these decisions that, oh, <laughs> well, what should my district be doing? Mm -hmm. What kind of school should the kids be studying in? What kind of hospital should be there? Mm -hmm. This is a transformation, yeah. isn't it? And probably a very good uh, example of, of, in some ways, a democracy, right? Where anybody who writes an objective exam gets to decide how a district has to be governed. Isn't democracy, I mean, the fundamental, I think, requirement of a democracy is equal opportunity. Mm. There are no rulers enrolled. Mm. I mean, you may have very much more uh, developed and much more prosperous nations in Middle East. You may have Saudi Arabia where people are so rich, mm. but you can never be a ruler there if you're an ordinary person. You have to be from the king's family, mm. isn't it? But you see, I mean, you see India. I mean, you go anywhere. Any post in the country is open to you. From a lower division clerk to the prime minister's post, you go. If you want to go to, into politics, you may land up in a prime minister one prime ministerial post one day. You want to go into civil services, the top is open to you. Anybody can go there. And what more beautiful uh, interpretation of democracy can be there? But then there's this other reality as well. I was uh, looking up on data for how many. Indian students appear for civil services every year, which is almost a million, huh? And uh, less than 1,000 people make it to any sort of service, 100, 150 who make it to the All India Services. So this, this percentage is probably less than 1% of those who write this exam, uh, you know, get selected. What do you think of the remaining 99% or 99.9% .9 people? Uh, and many of those who may have written the exam with the intention of nation building, of this change that you were talking about. And many of those would be watching this podcast. W one of them is interviewing you today because I've written the exam and always, you know, we, we've grown up in this environment we are talking about. Where Papa Mummy is up to the Deshki Seva Kandi, though IAS exam to Liknahi Padega. But those who write it and don't make it, what is your miss? So that's why I'm not asking you tips for how to crack the IAS exam. Those who don't crack it, how do they reconcile? It's a fact of life that the majority of people will not qualify themselves. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's how it's made. But I think this exam is a transformational journey. As you prepare and as you one day at least give one attempt or two attempts, I think it changes a lot inside everybody. One, it equips you with a lot of information, which then makes you eligible for every other exam possibly in the world, isn't it? I think second most important thing which it does is that it enables you to handle failure. And it enables you to grow, I think, with it. It is not an easy thing to prepare for four years 
and then not not get, not qualify at all and then go home and start something afresh i know what kind of a disaster emotional financial family wise or professional disaster it's for some people but i also know that a lot of people have now learned to negotiate this okay we are into this it's also a little bit of gamble at times that mm. i'll give my best if it works well and good mm. but i will not be a loser if i leave this without getting qualified okay okay so i would suggest maybe anybody who is watching us and anybody who is preparing uh, that give you a best shot maybe attempt two attempts mm. fine doesn't work don't feel that this is end of the world there's a lot of there are a lot of things out there the world is such a big place huge place where uh, so many opportunities to work and see this time when you were preparing as part of your uh, part of your growth part of your struggle part of your resiliency building that okay this is something which made me stronger see it as a beautiful memory that you met people isn't it yeah. and don't see it as a failure because i mean 99% chances are there that you will fail mm. so there is no shame in that at least don't feel ashamed of yourself that i'm a upsc dropper it is not almost everybody is <laughs> right very few i mean even if today i have to appear again i will never possibly even qualify prelims So some people will make it some won't make it but I think ultimately what matters is that you are living a productive life huh right. you are contributing in your own way in your own way and in you for the nation building yeah. yeah so once you cleared the civil services and then you've held so many positions as a bureaucrat in Kashmir what and we've spoken about identity politics culture religion not talking about development like hardcore development education health infrastructure tourism What are the top three, four changes that you've seen in real terms as far as Kashmir's development is concerned? And do you think also pulling out of Article three seventy? Do you think that has also ushered, uh, you know, greater strength in the way or greater force in the way, uh, you know, development is making inroads in Kashmir? I think one of the first uh, transformational changes which is visible on the ground, which anybody who has been there before can notice. is the law and order number 1 that kashmir is a peaceful place in 2012 one important writer called manu joza hmm. he wrote an article in the open magazine okay he said kashmir is happy yeah kashmir was happy that time a lot of people had an objection to that how can you say kashmir is happy he came and he saw tourists and he saw the things happening there when you see kashmir today Kashmir is actually happy because Kashmir number 1 has a very stable law and order situation now you are not witnessing encounters anymore there is no stone pelting nobody is being detained youngsters are not missing their classes right right nobody is being uh, like harassed by anybody terrorists have gone no families now have to mourn the loss of their young kids yeah. because of terrorism somebody gets killed somewhere so these are like phenomenal times number 1 number 2 tourism because tourism was directly dependent on the perception of peace that the perception of peace Im- improved the morale of forces improved you now have like tourists from across the world coming back to kashmir you will not honestly speaking i'm an officer from there and so many requests i get to get bookings <laughs> uh-huh. it is so difficult uh-huh. to get a room in srinagar yeah it is so difficult even for us ah uh-huh. so i have at times offered people okay you're welcome to come to my home because i cannot give you a room it's very tough and this has really changed because i i remember 10 years pehle jab when kashmir was considered as your summer destination a lot of people uh, in family or friends would be like acha bhi dekh lena wahan situation theek hai ki nahi hai and sarkari gaadi mein to chalna mat private gaadi lena thing has gone so you can go to any corner of kashmir today without armed guards anywhere and enjoy your time you can go for trekking there are new destinations like bangas valley it is such a serene pristine valley which is like uh because there is not much of construction yet so it's a beautiful place to visit a lot of people are now going to these off road destinations right there are places like lola places like gurez where people are going and exploring and trekking right which used to be unthinkable yeah. once upon a time somebody even if he came they used to stay in srinagar maybe just dal lake and thoda sa nishad bag and shalimar bag dekh liya that situation has changed that's the second important transformation third i think would be uh, if i say is which is health 
I think Kashmir has been consistently rated very high. Ha. Huh. On health indicators. On public health indicators. The I think one of the most uh, revolutionary steps which has been taken is this scheme which you call the golden card scheme the uh, this um, Ayushman Bharat Yojana where everybody is getting 5 lakh rupees insurance. In Kashmir it's very unique. In other parts of the country this insurance is available only to the BPL people, people below the poverty line. In Kashmir it's available to everybody. Okay, so you have a So everybody has an assured 5 lakh rupees insurance card in his pocket. And I can't tell you the kind of transformational change this card has brought in. It has made people so much you know, people used to get bankruptcy because they had to make some expenditure on getting a cholecystectomy done or thoda sa kisi ki tongue toot ki and you have to get an operation done, you have to sell your land. It is saving lives, it is saving people from bankruptcy and it has given so much of confidence to lakhs of people. And I think this is one of the most important innovations in the governance and in development which has happened in Kashmir in the last so many years. Wow, wow. So three things done. Yeah. What do you think about business opportunities? Because it's not as straightforward to think about it. Of course, you know, protection of local land and property. Uh, and then we've seen the mess that, you know, businesses from, especially in hill states, can do and the disaster that they can do to the environment. I mean, that's also another thing. How do you envisage business opportunities, com- commerce activities in Kashmir? Do you see that? Do you see a demand for that as well? So Jammu and Kashmir presently has a new industrial policy which has made it very flexible for the entrepreneurs and startups to get land. And in the last couple of years, we have seen like uh, crores of rupees of investment being pledged both within the nation and outside country also. A lot of foreign investors are showing interest. You recently saw this G20 conference being held there. Right. And you had ambassadors of so many countries traveling to Srinagar. It was unprecedented. And we also saw so many CEOs of various uh, companies in the world traveling mm-hmm. to Srinagar. So a business climate is also improving. The ease of, deva- ease of doing business is improving in Kashmir. And a lot of new investment is coming in. Uh, it will take some time for that investment to show on the ground. But I can tell you that... Uh, These are times which we have never seen. These are unprecedented historical times in Kashmir. Uh, A lot of positivity around in every sector that you can see. And what happened two days ago when Kashmiris, I mean, I wrote a tweet on that, that Kashmiris have like warmly and openly and and jubilantly uh, embraced Taranga the way it has never happened in the past. For that large dog. That tells you, yeah, exactly. That tells you that coming days are going to be beautiful if we can possibly stay on track and, and include people, give opportunities to youth. Uh, I mean, the good governance has to continue and uh, the LG there, LG Saab there, Mr. Manoj said, I mean, his entire team, uh, phenomenal work has been happening for the last couple of years and uh, I mean, that the results are obviously showing up. Showing up. You spoke about youth. Um, if you, I was Googling and I told you about this before we uh, started doing this, that when I googled Kashmiri youth, I was like, let's pick up some keywords. Google kya dikha hai meko. And it showed me a, a Kashmiri youth who's come all India 7, again in UPSC. A guy who's cracking some IT solution. Somebody who's been given some medal at Hollywood. What is Kashmiri youth currently? Yeah, and especially with, you know, coming down of Article 370, what are they most aspirational about? What are they looking forward to? I think this is a very interesting search that you've done and it tells you about the aspirational aspect of the Kashmiri youth at the moment. Uh, it also tells you about the change of narrative because we have seen like there used to be a lot of negativity. If you would search possibly Kashmiri youth a few, year, few years ago, yeah. you would hear about, read about Kashmiri youth getting killed, Kashmiri youth pelt guns, Kashmiri youth this, Kashmiri youth that. Yeah. Hartal and all that. Yeah. Today, it tells you, the Google tells you, the news that a lot of things have changed in Kashmir. And Kashmiri youth are today aspiring for new jobs. Some are creating content on social media and making money out of it. Some are now into tourism. Some have started their own ventures. A lot of startups are coming. So many cafeterias have opened in Kashmir, in Sirinagar. Such beautiful new concept-based, theme-based cafes where you can go and enjoy your drink, enjoy your coffee. 
uh, a new cinema has opened up it's a phenomenal new change it has been going house yeah. full <laughs> the lal chowk has completely changed the smart city project which happened there it has totally transformed that place and youth are now coming out and joining universities in the country going and getting jobs there mm-hmm. so i think that confusion which which has possibly gone uh, that has brought in a lot of dividends and youth are becoming in sports there is a phenomenal participation i mean you'll be surprised to know that around um, 46 lakh students participated in in sports activities this year maybe must be more as as i speak this time that tells you the kind of big things which are happened yeah. and the narrative has shifted yeah. the kind of negativity that was being reported all the time from kashmir that's not there anymore yeah. kashmiri is today kashmir today is a positive happy aspirational developing progressive place mm. which is welcoming people from across the world that brings me to the last question what's next uh you've been a topper at the civil services you're a doctor and um, short stint at politics and there's just so much uh, you've uh, what's what's inspiring you now what's the next challenge you want to take up or take on i mean it's tough i don't think i have done much yet one maybe in the in my professional field i want to do something which is important right second uh I want to read and write a little bit more. I remember my father when he was in his must have been in this like late forties. I was a young kid, mm. and at that time he was learning a new language. He was learning a foreign language, so that is something which still inspires me. That okay, I must do a lot more. Mm. At times I try my hand with my kid. Now that he is learning a lot of new things, so I try. Okay, I mean I want to learn some music. I want to learn a foreign language. I want to read some new book, good books. I want to uh, write, maybe. At times, I do write some columns or something randomly or something. But I want to do some serious work. Uh, I, at times, at at a certain stage of my life, I also wanted to write a film. Wow! Yes, okay. I I did a I did a course on screenwriting also. Yes, did it. Wanted to write it, but uh, didn't get time. Yeah, basically a lot of stuff. Yeah, okay. yeah, a so, lot of things on the. A lot of things uh, okay. in my, a lot of things in my mind. I keep on. I try to learn new things, okay. and uh, I'm not shy of learning from anybody. Hmm. I think one thing which I have learned in my life is that uh, you die the day you stop learning. Right. Yeah. So I think you must learn. You must read and write, even if you have a very stable career, the way you are an IAS or you are an IPS. Okay. You don't need to do anything else then, because your salary will in any case keep coming. but i think for personal growth you need to develop new skills right you need to do maybe listen to new music i try to listen to music in other languages hmm kabhi persian music kabhi arabic kabhi spanish will go to kabhi mai haryanvi sununga kabhi mai bhojpuri sununga so there is a huge range yeah uh just mai i try to experiment kabhi orchestra sununga hmm i'm trying to like keep myself busy and and learn new things meet new people go to new places I think we'll end on that note that the that you die the day you stop learning, and I think podcasts like these and are, never stop learning because uh, the life never stops teaching. Life never stops teaching. A dialogue from my teacher. A dialogue from your teacher, and possibly in a movie that you might script write for. Yeah, uh, maybe you never know. <laughs> you never know. On that note, uh, we come to an end for this episode. Thank you for your time, and thanks a lot for this very very interesting conversation with. multiple dimensions i mean i'll have to think about a lot of things that you said <laughs> thank you so much thank you so much hope you enjoyed this episode as we dived into the life of shah faisal whose remarkable journey does inspire reflection if you have any feedback or any questions for this episode please feel free to drop your comments in the comment box below and we will come back to you soon with another exciting episode till then take care and stay healthy